good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our governance panel. This is uh, this session is powered by IC Square Toronto Chapter. Uh, so this is we have the governance panel. So let me just uh, very quickly give you an you know, an, an overview about the IC Square. So the IC Square is the world leading cybersecurity and IT security professional organization. It was founded in 1998, uh, 99. Uh, sorry, 19, 1989 with the objectives of standardization and certification in the cyber security industry. We are committed to educating the general public through the support of the Center of Cyber Security Safety and Education. We are offering globally recognized and gold standard certification in the InfoSec and cyber security. And you can see in the bottom, you know, those are like the CSSP, the CCSP as well, and you have also the concentration so worldwide we have 140k number of certified members and we have more than 140 numbers of chapters so as we said this session is powered by the ic square toronto chapter and our key objectives as a toronto chapter is to promote advance the profession of cyber security create educational events and opportunities connect and advance the infosec professionals across uh, the GTA. So right now we have over a thousand members and uh, we have also over a hundred members that they have officially the IC Square credentials. Uh, if, you're, if you don't know our team, this is our team. So Victoria Granova is our president, Razwan is uh, membership director, Anna secretary, Sean is the treasurer, Jason is responsible for communications here, the director, myself, I'm responsible for the partnership directors and IC Square and certifications and Rafael for audit and compliance. So just to give you an update, we have uh, in June our meeting, our monthly meeting, it's uh, June 24. It's gonna be very interesting uh, meeting, uh, event. Uh, we're gonna talk about privacy, GDPR, CCPA, uh, PEPEDA, oh my. Uh, we have also digital forensics, so we're gonna have something very, very uh, unique, uh, and I think it's gonna be very insightful for our members. But for today, I have the pleasure to introduce the panel security governance. So, Junaid, Bill, and Tracy. So I will give like uh, everybody the opportunity to present themselves and give us like, uh, give the, uh, the people who are watching us uh, some information about them as a security professional. So can we start with Junaid, please? Uh, hi there, thank you, Ferris. Uh, so uh, I, my name is Junaid Karul and I am the Director of Information Security and Compliance at Blue Cat Networks uh, and Blue Cat is a network software company uh, based in Toronto. We have about 400 people. And as a security professional, I have been uh, in security, cybersecurity for about 15 years now. Uh, the last five of years of which was at Blue Cat and my role there is more on the governance and you know uh, social aspects of security. But my background is software development and architecture and I've been uh, working at different positions at different companies mostly on the software development and architecture side. And the reason I was, uh, I got into the security business is because one of the companies I worked for was an encryption company. So I had a lot of technical hands-on experience there. Thank you, uh, Bill. Sure, um, name's Bill Olson. Currently the Chief Information Security Officer at a company called Nanopay. It's a, a startup based in Toronto. I've uh, been in security, uh, in some shape or form for a better part of 15 years. Uh, my background's a bit of a mix of the security as well as program and project management. Thank you. Tracy, thank you. Hi everyone, thanks Ferris. So my name's Tracy Van Giel. I am currently the Global Director of Risk Security and Compliance for Compass Group. Compass Group is a global food services company. We're the largest in the world, based out of the UK. And I've been with Compass Group for the past four years in various roles, starting as the uh, Senior Director of Cybersecurity for Canada, moving into a more North American role and, and just joined the global team 
in April of this year. I have about 15 years uh, experience in cybersecurity, but over 30 years of experience in IT. And I've had the pleasure of working with Ferris, for example, in, uh, in the banking industry. And I also have in, uh, experience in uh, industries uh, such as uh, food and beverage, uh, nuclear and, and uh, food services where I am today. Okay, thank you, Tracy. So starting our conversation, let me start with this open statement about, because we are talking about IC Square and our gold standard certification, the CSSP. So the Certified Information Security Professional Certification has been granted a qualification uh, equal to the master degree across Europe. And this change will enable, you know, the cybersecurity professionals to use the CSSP certifications towards higher education courses and open new opportunities for roles that require or recognize a master's degree. So my question, the first question to uh, Junaid. Junaid, what do you think about uh, the CSSP uh, being, you know, one of the tools to uh, enforce security awareness across the companies and your experience in your company? Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, my background is more on the software side and I did a lot of cryptography, high math, and uh, that's where my strong points were. And I always assumed I'm a very good security person, but when I decided to get my CISSP certification, I realize that it is actually only part of a bigger picture. And CSSP was very useful for me personally because it let me learn a lot more uh, about the governance side of things, which is what I'm doing today for a living, as well as the network security uh, and even physical security. So CISSP is great in giving a very well-rounded overall uh, framework for a security professional. And I also advise a lot of young people who came to me and I mentor them and they usually ask the same question, should we go get a, a master's degree or a PhD or should we go for a certification? So I actually recently uh, was a presenter at one of the universities in Toronto and that question was asked to me by some PhD students. And uh, I do have a master's degree and a PhD, so I definitely am not saying those are not useful. However, in the cybersecurity industry today, having a CISSP probably is one of the best things you can do for your career. And uh, they are actually very good in terms of uh, understanding the overall picture about security. So I, I believe uh, having them at the master's levels and uh, you know studying them at universities is going to be a great addition to our industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bill, do you want to add something to this? Sure. I mean, I, I think you could have said it well that... Uh... It helps provide a very solid foundation, kind of a level playing field to start out so that not just what you may have already been drawn to, but the full aspect of what uh, information security encompasses. But it's also, uh, I find helpful as far as it's uh, a ready set community for uh, you to interact with peers and others. Um, I've had the benefit of switching between a few different companies and different locations. And one of the things I can always count on is there's typically an ISC square chapter in the, the whatever city I, I land in. So I, I immediately have a, a sense of community with people that are of like mind as well as what's going on in our industry and particularly in, in the area that you're in. Okay, so Tracy, do you as a multinational company compass, I mean, how are your experience with cert when it comes to certifications? Well, the lovely thing about things like the certifications you get with the CISSP is, is international. And uh, what we find with Compass is we have, like any multinational company, there's a lot of uh, business culture that's different as well as, as country culture. But the having a certification that's an internationally uh, recognized standard is excellent for us because we know that each pe person in our organization, regardless of where they are working, which part of the business they're in, they can all speak the same language and they have the same shared experience to leverage. And that is very powerful when you're trying to uh, get past the, the conversations about, you know, why should we do, say, uh, you know, manage our cryptography better? Well, we don't actually have to explain the basics of what cryptography are with people who have actually been involved and have their certification. So we, we leverage it highly across the world in on all of our locations that we have cybersecurity professionals at. Okay, thank you. 
uh, let me start now taking this conversation into educating senior management on security awareness and something we keep talking tune at the top right so tune at the top is so important so can you please like give us from your experience you know how you are educating your senior management especially now with companies impacting with COVID-19 and everybody now is talking about security awareness and everybody's working from home remotely. Uh, Tracy, do you want to start with this? Sure. So like all companies, we have senior executives that who are, are that fancy that they're excellent uh, technology and, and security people. And uh, we, we also have those who uh, are, are struggling just to use the technology as a normal user. So what we've been doing is spending a lot of time talking about risk management and security programs in respect to business terms, focusing on how we can educate people at the, ex at the executive level about their, their, the risk to the business and how the risk and, and talk about risk in dollar value. So what is the potential for loss? Uh, based on what we what we see and what we can mitigate through our cybersecurity programs, that is the best way we've found so far to educate our executives on, you know, the the whether it's COVID, it, that's a business risk. Whether it's and we we've experienced a lot of business risk, obviously, with with being a food service company in this this past uh, four or five months. Um, so they understand those terms, and, and so we, we try to take, stay away from the technical terms. But it takes people who can actually communicate or, or take the ideas from a, a cybersecurity perspective and, and replay that in a business perspective. It, it takes some really uh, advanced thinking for that. Okay, thank you. And uh, going to Bill, Bill, all the time we hear about the weakest link all the time in cybersecurity because we have technology processes and people people are the weakest link element so how we can work on that i think education is probably the the e well, quote unquote easy answer um getting as tracy mentioned you have users of all skill sets in a company regardless of what their position in the company is there's some people that are very susceptible to things like phishing others that are a little bit more sophisticated so what we've tried to do at, uh, at NanoPay as well as other places I've been is put in place some uh, education program for uh, the employees. And it's varied by the type of company I've been in. Uh, I'm fortunate right now I'm in a relatively small company. So it's we're relatively homogenous as far as the, the type of people we have. We're very developer heavy. So a lot of people are very technical focused. So we can kind of use one program for all where in a larger, more complex organization, We've had to devise ways of um, getting a little bit more role specific kind of training and awareness, but it, it just kind of comes back to finding a way to keep that education in front of them, reminding them, particularly mm -hmm. people that are in more susceptible areas like phishing is a big concern. So those people with some control over the money, like in finance, accounting, um, what's the best way to communicate to them? What are the things that they've done? Educate them using that if you can. Good. So going back to Janet, Janet, uh, what's your experience in your company educating people like business users, normal business users like finance, how we can educate them about uh, phishing or cryptography or being secure, you know, not to click on some links. So what's your experience? Can you tell us please about your experience? Sure. Uh, as I mentioned, my company is a mid-sized company, so we have different departments. We are developer heavy as well, but we have a lot of other technical people as well as finance, marketing, different types of people. Uh, so starting with from the executive part, again, I agree with you that tone at the top is very important. So one thing we did uh, before getting to the awareness test, uh, sorry, the uh, training is involving the uh, directors or managers of different uh, sections. So I've been chairing the information security committee at Blue Cat for about four years now. We have monthly meetings and in that meeting, I have representatives of each division. I have product people, I have salespeople. And those meetings actually are great because at the very top level of the company, they come and attend, we present them stuff uh, and then we actually discuss security related things. And this is occurring like regularly. And once they are involved with that, it uh, gives them a different perspective on what security is all about. 
uh, as a corporation, we do have mandatory uh, security awareness training that we repeat once a year. It's not very hard, but it covers the basics of phishing and what to look for, how you set your password, that kind of stuff. And we actually do have a test too. So everybody actually has to test it. Uh, besides that, we also have department specific training. I recently uh, actually had a meeting with the finance department and we are discussing going through their processes, what kind of processes they have actually might have security uh, weaknesses and how can we improve on that. We have a special program for developers. Customer care people has a different data, customer data handling kind of a type of education. We also, like most companies, if you are accepting a payment card, you have to go through a PCI training and we have a subset of our finance team actually goes through that training. So what I observed is a one general training for everybody to learn the basics and then providing individualized departments uh, or division, you know, specific training works best for us. Okay, good. Thank you. So Tracy, now Jeanette mentioned very good, interesting information about, you know, training and different training for different departments. But the question now, how are you going to measure the effectiveness of those training? How you, like as a company, feel, you know, those uh, training, they are effective? Well, this is exactly what Tracy said, is that it's about uh, having the right measurements in place and not just, you know, providing training for everyone. It's got to be effective. That is something that we have been working towards. Uh, I'm going to say it's a work in progress again because it's such a large company and we're fairly, we're a federated management model. So there, there isn't an opportunity for me at the top to say, thou shalt all do it this way. So the, the way that we've been approaching it is twofold. Uh, you know, again, making sure we have the appropriate training for the people available monitoring whether or not they're actually taking the training in a timely fashion. Uh, often we have uh, client contracts where we are required to make sure that we, as part of our contract, that we are providing training to our associates that, who are working at places like Rogers or Microsoft or Amazon and make sure that those people have appropriate training while they're operating at those facilities. But that doesn't actually tell you if that training is effective. And so some of the tools that we've been using are things that allow us to monitor their, their training through uh, the effectiveness of how the, the redu reduction in their click rate, for example. So um, making sure that our, our phishing testing is integrated with the training so that people are getting just in time, um, immediate feedback on what they did right or wrong during the, the, that phishing exercise. Uh, we're also looking at and have implemented ongoing security awareness. So gamification of security awareness allows people to interact with some characters that some uh, get sort of a, a very specific experience that's uh, in the food service business. So for example, our main characters we use for our security awareness are actually chefs. And, and those, those characters look like chefs and we do a lot of... Um, of catchy awareness campaigns that talk about, you know, it's like baking a cake and, and using food related um, experiences so people can relate to um, the cyber, cyber experience that we're looking for them to, to um, become part of their DNA. So it, it takes a lot of work and effort, but absolutely, if you can get the effectiveness measures, which is you know, reduction in the number of, of, uh, of actual accounts being compromised, the, the, the reduction in the actual loss events. Uh, we talked a little bit, Bill was talking about the social engineering side of this. It's, it's not just about a, a click, it's about the people in finance who are being called up and asking to, uh, to, to expose their information so that the finance people can uh, you know, take over and, and perhaps reroute uh, somebody's, somebody's expense claims to the wrong account. And there's a lot of different things going on in that space that you can leverage and, and make sure that your people are not responding just to the training, but that that training is effective in hitting your other metrics, your other risk metrics, like reduction in, in, in your uh, click rate, 
uh, reduction in loss of, of time incidents, loss of, of uh, account um, and, and remediation work. Okay, thank you. Jeanette? Uh, so we talked about phishing. So Tracy mentioned about it. So educational part is on one side and we did similar studies. We looked into what is the pattern, who's clicking, are they learning? If they are assigned to a training, do they perform better? But there's also another thing, even if they did not work, which they do, is it, they actually create these phishing tests, a very good basis to sell a project to your executive management because security is a very hard sell. We all know that. We are all professionals in this field for years and we understand that it is really not easy to go to your boss and say, hey, can you give me a couple hundred thousand dollars? I'm going to implement this. And they're going to ask you why. Like, why do we need this? But when you do a phishing test and good chunk of people fail it and they go click on stuff and then you explain to them that that, that could be uh, one of the executives and we could actually uh, lose customer data. Uh, it puts it into a perspective. So training or education is not just teaching people what to do, what not to do, but it is a cultural event that people always are looking, people know whom the uh, incident to report to. Uh, if we did one thing good at Blue Cat, we still have people clicking on stuff, I cannot say we don't, but at least they know, like they click and then they just post it to the uh, security channel. By the way, I got this message, I clicked on it, did I do it right? And then we immediately provide them a feedback. So we created a culture of not being scared of things uh sharing the knowledge and if you suspect just uh send it to somebody and let's have a look at it so i think uh, for us what worked was after a couple of years of phishing tests we implemented other technical controls that even if somebody clicks on something we still have multi-factor authentication it's not as easy as to uh penetrate into the systems and compromise them okay good bill do you have anything to add to this I think these guys highlighted well. I mean, there's the, the initial feedback from the the testing or training that goes right away that you click on it. Oh, you failed. Hey, here's what you can learn about it. But then the ongoing analysis of the data, like what incidents or events are occurring, and can we tie that back to the uh, the training to give people context of why what they're doing is working or not? Uh, everybody likes to to get the feedback. So if you keep that dialogue open, I think. Um, it helps everybody. So it's, it isn't a scary thing. It's, oh, this happened. Here's what we do. Okay. I'd like also to take this conversation to the next level when I think we have seen a lot of security breaches that are related to insider threat, like insider, like employees, drug employees, they, they have, you know, exposed, uh, you know, some of the customer's data to the public. And we have seen some examples, you know, I don't want to mention the names of those companies here, but is th is this is like the reason if we look at the root cause of those security breaches, is it like lack of security awareness or training or this is something different? How, Tracy, how you look at, what's your, what's your perspective on this? So we've just gone through a re review of our overall policy framework and part of that was doing a threat analysis and, and I'm sure we in the security team side, everybody knows that, you know, we're trust but verify is, is our sort of our ongoing motto, but it's not necessarily easy to action that motto. It's, it's you, you know it, but what are you going to do and what kind of uh, uh, protections you want to put in place? So as Trudy said, you get a lot of uh, uh, positive feedback from the finance people when you say, I need money to protect the system by you're putting MFA in so that people stop clicking and losing money. They, they, they get that. Um, where, you, you know, talking about managing insider threats, it's a little bit more of a difficult conversation. So we went through this year, we went through, uh, a threat analysis exercise and brought together some business people and we went through um, we had a, a partner outside of our company help us through this but it, it it's a methodology that's pretty common and, and essentially what you do is you look at all the potential threats out there and whether they're adversarial or whether they're accidental and you group those threats into you know the most common threats you think will be present themselves to your company um, for example, uh, an, uh, an adversarial uh, external threat might be, um, uh, you know, organized crime. In your business, that might not be uh, any different than a nation state attempting to do hacking. 
So both of those could be addressed the same way. Internal, um, internal employee or disgruntled employee is an, another adversarial threat, but more likely what you're gonna see is an accidental uh, situation where somebody's made an exposure accidentally. So we also categorize that as well as our third party because you know, we rely so much on our third party vendors nowadays for SaaS solutions, for you know, uh, cloud solutions, whatever. And we need to be able to say, is it possible that an accidental uh, incursion by a third party can expose our company to a uh, risk that we can't potentially um, easily mitigate or can't, uh, will not know about in a timely fashion? So that, that is where I would start. And, and certainly that's driven our policies, our, our um, approaches and our programs for the next three to four years. And we'll revisit that every year, to see if there's a change. Thank you. Well, Bill, what about you? I think Tracy outlined it really well. I mean, the, the malicious insider is a really tricky one to do because if your program works perfectly, everyone follows all the processes, all the tools work. These are people that you have in some part of that flow trusted with some information and they decided to do something wrong with it. So I think the threat model Tracy outlines typically what you do is like, what, what are the scenarios that we're really concerned about and put as many of those mitigation steps in there as possible. So are we vetting enough as far as who gets access and when, who can approve, how are we reviewing these things? Um, on one hand, it's almost, uh, an aspiration to be able to focus on the malicious insider because there's so much of your program that has to be put in place in order to, to worry about that, that, that edge case. But um, it is a very tricky one. I would, I would agree with the trace assessment that from what I've seen in our companies, most of the issues tend to be accidental that people aren't consistently following a process. So it's kind of how do you, what are the things we can do to tighten these up so that we can make it easier for people to follow the process. Nobody wants to read through documents after documents. It's, you know, what are the support structures, whether technology or otherwise, that we put in there to keep them on the right path? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Jeanette? Uh, so uh, both Bill and Tracy actually touched very valid points, so I totally agree with all of them. But uh, I also want to remark something that when we first started cybersecurity 15 years ago, even 20 years ago, cybersecurity was more about you have this perimeter or boundary and you're trying to protect stuff and inside whatever happens is we're all family we're very good and you don't have to worry about it so this is changing a lot and that actually is helping the insider thread because in the past it was all about firewall rules are you blocking this port? are you preventing people to come into your environment but today we are talking about concepts such as zero trust network or segregation of duties, or you know these are all CISSP terms. But there is also uh, you know security by design because when we are designing systems today, whether it be a like software or a network or a corporate you know infrastructure, we are assuming people are going to fail. And as Bill said, most of them are actually by mistakes. I just had an incident yesterday. It was a mistake. Somebody push the wrong button and send something someplace that it shouldn't have gone. But what are you doing in the design of that system to foresee such mistakes? And are you splitting the risk? Are you letting a single person to have all the power to leak a very, very critical information? Or do you have uh, different layers of defense? So make sure if one fails, the other one is going to catch it, which is actually exactly what, where the security industry is going these days. We are assuming uh, insider threats are going to be there. Most of them are going to be simple mistakes, but uh, I think we are on the right track. We are uh, making sure people know as much as they need to know. Uh, roles are segregated, so we know that a single person or single team cannot actually give too much damage. And that is actually one of the other reasons why we should look into cybersecurity, not just as a technical thing, but an overarching, you know, a bigger picture. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm just addressing some of the questions I, I there is I have seen now in the windows. So I I got a question or it seems a comment and a question. So they are saying interesting from Junaid protection from phishing, where even you click on a link and then two uh, two factor authentication intervenes as a further measure. Can you please elaborate on suggestions how to do that? Sure, absolutely. So. 
some of the tests we did in our past was uh, a bit tricky. So we use Office 365 as most companies do now. And you can log on to your Office 365 if you're using just one single factor and your password uh, logs you into your email account. Uh, it is very easy to fake Office 365 logon page. If your phishing test or a real phishing attack is able to take a user to an Office 365 logon page looking place, many of your users will gladly give their passwords there. So it is actually very easy to lose your password. Uh, we've seen this over and over. Uh, industry standard, I believe, is somewhere around 15% in the high-tech industry. We are right about there. But if you are a company of 100 people, you can assume 15 of them are, you know, uh, are going to go click on that link. And it, maybe at least a couple of them will lose their password. So when you have multi-factor authentication, the hacker will have your password, but they won't be able to log on to your emails. Because usually a typical attack starts with penetrating into your email systems, and then they go through your emails, they find other contacts, they find invoices, they find a lot of valuable information, and then target attacks based on that information. If you can cut that uh, authentication piece right there, you are eliminating a very good chunk of that kind of attacks. Uh, we actually, uh, the, the reason I was able to sell this idea to the company was actually Google did this. Google actually does not allow any of their employees to log on to their systems without multi-factor authentication. And they observed like 100% cut of all uh, account hijackings. The, the minute they implemented it, it becomes almost impossible. So that's what I meant by, uh, by multi-factor authentication. You can uh, at least put another layer to the hackers to get into your systems. Otherwise, your entire system is protected by a single password. And if you're using single sign-on as we do, that not only opens your Office 365, it is your VPN password, it is your Salesforce password. All the systems that you're hosting is only uh, depending a single password. So that's why MFA, I believe, is a very, very good technical control for that. Thank you. Anybody wants to add to Junaid or? Well, I note that even though a lot of people previous to COVID would have used the same password for their login to work as well as their same password to log into their Facebook account, it's become even more prevalent because people are now using their work computers in their home environment and it's blurred the lines a little bit for people on what is appropriate to use your work computer for. Uh, we, you know, we obviously put in controls to make sure that people are limiting their uh, use of, of company resources for things that are inappropriate, but it still is what we've seen is, is an increase in traffic in IDs and uh, passwords on the dark and gray web, uh, which we have services that monitor that for our key individuals, and we've seen it, an increase of that because there are people who are saying, oh, I'm just going to log into my Amazon account and order that food or delivery, whatever. No, my, I might as well make that the same account as what I'm typing in now. And so that, you know, what Trudy says is it's so important, multi-factor authentication. And in his case, two-factor, but certainly two or three-factor authentication is going to become um, more and more important to us going forward across all systems. Okay, great. Uh, Bill, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, as far as uh, it's always hard to uh, get more money in your security budget, but if you do have the ability to, to leverage an identity provider, that's one of the things I've found that, that's been very helpful where, um, A, for your users, it makes it a little bit easier on them that they go to this one place to access work-related stuff. But then you can consolidate a lot of the additional checks um, and some of the fancier features that, you know, hey, we don't recognize where you're coming from, so we're going to ask you more questions before you're allowed to access, rather than trying to replicate that in every single application they may use for work. So trying to get O365 to have the same parameters as some of the other applications they may need is very difficult, and that's a, a big time suck for a lot of the teams that support it. So you can kind of consolidate where possible, frees up people to focus on making identity really strong, but also a little bit easier for your, your workforce so they don't have 16 different things they need to log into. 
Yeah, this conversation is going to bring something, you know, to my mind. I had this conversation with one of the VP security uh, last year, and he was telling me in 2021, our company, they're going to launch uh, something. I mean, uh, it seems to be to cut cost, although they are a big company. Bring your own laptop to work. It's not bring your BYUD, you bring your mobile device, but bring your own laptop to work. So how are you going to, what's your thoughts about, you know, if, Really, companies now start adapting this policy by asking employees to bring their own laptop and use it for, for work. Tracy? <laughs> oh, wow. I don't know that we do a good job of BYO um, bring your own mobile device to work, so I, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm good for that. I, it, it's an interesting um, budgetary item. I think with our needs to make sure that the environments we're working on are, are, are patched and, and, and there's a appropriate antivirus and there's a vulnerabilities are checked, et cetera. It's a, it's a bit of a minefield to say, okay, I'm gonna allow you to bring whatever piece of equipment you wish. I was gonna use another expletive, but piece of equipment that you want. And I'm gonna let you to connect to my network and, 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 and oh, oh yeah, also connect to our key financial systems. And uh, that, uh, that's a little scary venture, but you know what? If, as long as a company has uh, the, the appetite to do it, as well as the uh, wherewithal to protect that environment, you know, that, that's a, an interesting model. Okay, but this is, I think, it will need more awareness. It will, I mean, oh, we're yes. going to go to the next level of how you're going to educate people, you know, awareness to use, you know, their own laptop, their own device and use it for work and, you know, have that kind of distinction between what's, what's mine, what's my personal versus work. What do you think, Janet, about this? Sorry. Yeah, this is a very, very uh, tough topic. And uh, we, I personally, because Blue Cat has a different unique position, I'm not only responsible for Blue Cat security, but we also are a network appliance vendor. So I have to explain ourselves to some of the biggest companies in the world who use our products and software. And some of them are so picky, uh, they will not let you even bring your own cell phone to the office. Uh, so going from there to letting people use whatever computer they might will be a very tough thing for us to do. But if we had to do it, I believe the only, first of all, I, I believe in training education, that's very important. But when you have 400 different types of devices at different operating systems, patch levels, I don't see that as a security professional, a very good thing, quite frankly. Yeah. However, there are technologies out there. There are some virtualization technologies. I mean, we all grew up with, you know, the mainframes and then, you know, things have changed. So, there are solutions where you can isolate your work work into one, you know, sandbox, if you will. Uh, you can force people to work there. There are some uh, good products on uh, cell phones, for example. Like you can put all your business email into one app, and whenever that person leaves the company, or you know, they need to uh, leave because technically I own my own iPhone. The company does not own it, but all my emails are going to my uh, cell phone. So you should be able to remotely wipe those, manage them remotely. Mm -hmm. So there are some technical you know, measures that can enable such a move, but as a cybersecurity professional, I would, uh, I would see that as a very, very big risk on the other side. And I don't think the cost that is gonna be uh, you know, cutting for that company is not gonna be worth the risk we're taking on the other side. But that's my personal opinion. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, I wouldn't even think beyond the security risk highlighted, it'd just be a, it'd be a big hit to efficiency to have so many people on so many different platforms, devices, the support, the just troubleshooting people have in a normal day when everybody's on the same device is very difficult. If they've got everything out there, I can't imagine that work is going to be efficient at all, which is going to sacrifice any sort of cost savings they might have. Right. Thank you. So I would like to take, because some of the, also the questions here, and then I'm, I'm going this to Tracy. So Tracy, myself, I've been asked with a lot of people, they are like system analysts, they are like technical people, and they wants to migrate to cybersecurity. So all the time, the questions that they ask, what's the best place to start and how I should go from here? Yeah, so I get this a lot. Um, so the one of the first things I always tell people is, first of all, find somebody in the 
in your organization, or if you're in a consulting team as somebody who is in an organization like the ISCS squared, that you can find as a mentor. So first and foremost, find someone who can give you some guidance on what part of cybersecurity will be a good fit for you, as well as what part of the, you know, what are your goals and objectives and, and your dreams. So, you know, all of us have come through different uh, backgrounds. I've, I've met people, cybersecurity leaders who were completely business people and had no technology backgrounds whatsoever. I've had kids who are MBA grads who've launched in cybersecurity. It's not so much important that you are a techie and that you've had your, you know, you've had your experience pulling apart and, and managing network routers or, or that you're a software developer that's done a lot of code testing. What is important is that you understand that cybersecurity has a very broad range of skills and needs, all the way from people in governance like we are, where we're, oh, we're talking to business people. We need to speak business language, but also understand the core of parts of cybersecurity. So number one, get a mentor. Number two is uh, there are uh, so much uh, online free available training that you can prep and learn about things such as the CISSP or if you're launching towards a cloud, uh, a cloud first environment than the CCSP, those, those designations, you can still, without having maybe the work experience, and the um, you know the actual hands-on experience with cybersecurity, you can certainly learn a lot. And uh, by all means, uh, get yourself a mentor who can help you navigate the the different uh, areas that you can become an expert in. Okay, thank you, Jeanette. Yeah, I totally agree with Tracy. I was gonna uh, start with mentorship. She explained it so well. I'm not gonna add anything to it. Uh, again, we talked about certifications. Uh, for me, certifications were great because, again, I focused on one certification at a time, studied for it a month or two, whatever, took the exam, passed, got my certification, moved on. And every time I got a certification, I figured out I learned a different side of it. And some people come to me quite a bit and they want to be you know, hackers, they want to go into cybersecurity. The first thing I tell them, do you really know what I do for a living? Like what my day job looks like? So they should uh, apprentice themselves. And actually I got a couple of university students come to my office, they, they call it a shadowing program. So they basically walk through me, I book meetings, and many of them are actually shocked how non-technical of a job that I do. So it's not bad, I like what I do, but I think the first step is getting a mentor. The second step is understanding what are what does a cybersecurity person do? I mean, if you're in a SOC, uh, security operations center, you're doing incident handling, that is a very different job than what I do, mm -hmm. like uh, writing policies, talking to lawyers, reading <coughs> all day, or you could be a software security person, you could be writing cryptography code and testing, or pen tester, you're going into applications and testing them. So these are all very valid and good parts of cybersecurity. But the second phase is understanding which one is good for you and then follow the right track to get to that point. So I totally agree with Tracy. Okay, Bill. I totally agree with both of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I would add that, I mean, it is a very broad subject. So again, as they've said, like find some help in understanding the full aspect, whatever your background system and uh, network, it's all going to be an asset. That's probably going to be your strength. And it's just a decision of what's most attractive to you. Do you want to stay in that focus or do you want to broaden it to the policy and governance? I mean, um, cause then based on what you feel like you want to do, there's a lot of organizations that can support you in, in that way. So if you want to be hacking so many, uh, firms out there do external penetration testing, which all of us have to, to deal with, um, versus maybe some more corporate governance stuff or uh, SOC, maybe there's an MS, uh, a service provider out there that provides those services to others. And they, the one thing I have seen in our industry, which is great, there's always a need for people. So finding out what you want to do, I think there's a lot of opportunities to exploit mm -hmm. it. And then on the way, you know, start figuring out that long career path. All right, so certification will help it, or maybe a master's degree, whatever it might be. 
Is it fair to say to recommend to some of this person who's asking the question to try in his company to reach out to cybersecurity or security team and ask for walk a mile maybe with some security okay. that gives him maybe more insight okay what's day looks like for a security professional yeah yeah sure. and, and keep in mind that uh, one of the best ways to learn about what people do in our field is apply to some jobs that mm -hmm. there if you're a person who's graduated from university or you've worked on in a call center or even if you're just interested in in you know puzzles uh, it, it's something that you know you really you know you think of attorney his it, uh, most of what he's done in the cryptography is just really really advanced puzzles uh, so I don't mean to make it sound like it's easy but it is it it's beyond my capability for sure but certainly if you're if you have skill sets that are um, uh, transferable from other careers apply for some jobs in this space even if it says you must have a CISSP the the first thing that which is almost on every single job uh, posting I've seen or even an entry-level job in cybersecurity it says you know you want to have a CISSP well you, how do you get one if you don't have the job and how do you get the job if you don't have the designation and so what we what we would recommend you do is apply for the, some of those jobs and get get to sit in front of the people who are hiring talk about your skills and ask them if you're if you're not qualified or you're not meeting that job what would I need to do in order to become the person you would hire and then that's a great way to focus your attention on some on some new skill skill development right uh, so people, uh, I'm having a question for some people asking me, the C, uh, IC Square certification like CSSP always appears scary. <laughs> what do you advise? Like, I think this guy, maybe he's just uh, a fresh graduate from university or has been maybe working for two years. What do you advise those freshers in cybersecurity aspiring to become a CSSP certified? Junaid, I mean, did you get this experience with fresh graduate or freshers coming to you said, this is scary, how can I do that? Yeah, it's a big book, it's actually right over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's 1600 pages, so, but it's not a very hard read and it's actually interesting. The physical security was very interesting for me because it even teaches you like fire extinguishers and stuff, which for me oh, was probably. like, wow, I never thought I was gonna learn about those things. So uh, it is scary and uh, I can recommend two things. First of all, uh, if it is too hard for you, if uh, because I, I actually mentored some people who were not technical, who did not have any technology background and security background, and CISSP probably is a hard thing for them. Maybe they can start with some of the easier certifications or maybe taking some classes at universities. There are a lot of certification programs. You teach one, you know, Ferris, you know that, Ryerson. No, I, te one. Yeah, I teach one at UFT. Yeah, York does have one. So those are good places to start to, you know, improve your chops. The second one is, again, going back to CISSP, I was very comfortable in certain parts of it, but then I figured out certain parts I'm not. I actually took a break, went back and learned networking better because I was always a software person. I never really dealt with networks. I mean, I probably know more than an average person, but I don't know as much of it. So I literally took my time and learned networking and came back to CISSP. So that's number one. The second one is socializing. So one of the best things ISC Square does for me is once I got my certification years ago, I started attending meetings. I was not always regular, but when you go there, you meet a lot of people and there are different levels, there are different people, different backgrounds, and it is actually very good to talk to them, uh, get notes. I know not CISSP, which is your competitor, but CISM test. I know I met this person at a, you know, meeting and then he said oh i have notes i'll share them with you and you know he shares some of his notes with me, with me. so i would say uh, don't be scared start somewhere and always go find people and you can find those people in social events uh, there are a lot of security events going on many of them are free of charge i would say please socialize and come find us i mean i am totally fine you know if you reach out to me wherever on linkedin or come talk to me face to face when you can i'll be happy to you know guide you if i can Thank you. Bill? Yeah, I think uh, just parroting what was just said, I mean, a lot of it's practice. There's a reason they, they recommend a certain number of years because it is 1,600 pages is one way of context. There's a lot of information to, to cover. Yeah. Some of it you absorb while working. 
others you can focus on if it's not your strength. Um, but then also remember, I mean, it's a test. There's also just test taking techniques that uh, can help calm you down. You know, multiple choice, can you eliminate a few of the answers? Those kind of strategies that a lot of us have forgotten since they've left school, but you know, you can bring back. Yeah, myself, I mean, I'm, I'm not a panelist, but I can recommend as well with the natural growth. I would, this is my recommendation to my students and universities. Start with the natural growth with, as Junaid mentioned, with some certification and you can build up until you know, you get to the CSSP, understanding more about the concept and uh, the experience. So allow yourself if you are a, fre you know, a fresh graduate or somebody who has been on only working for two years, like your natural growth, be an associate with IC Square, come to our meetings. You can connect with uh, Junaid, Tracy or, you know, or Bill, and they will be more than happy to be, you know, giving you some advice and guidance to, to help you through this. So. I think the answer here, we are here to help and support whoever wants to get to the cybersecurity space. Okay, I have some questions to Tracy. So Tracy, people asking you about, you mentioned about the salaries and uh, somebody accepting, like go and put himself into, I mean, in front of, uh, you know, the hiring manager. But the question is, does it mean like a newbie Will have to accept a lower salary because their lack of their experience in cybersecurity. <laughs> hmm. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess it really depends on the, con the uh, company that you're applying for. And just so that uh, you know, just give you uh, you all an idea. When I work with Ferris, I worked for a, a bank. Um, I was making great salary. I was uh, in Toronto a lot, uh, but I don't live in Toronto. So, you know, I ended up uh, moving over to Compass Group at a lower salary. And, uh, but that allowed me to work from my home location in London, Ontario, and, and then to grow into the role I am today, where I'm actually in a role that, that's an overall global um, position. So I think you know everyone's different your needs are different but it, is it is it possible that you may take a, a role that is a a lateral move that may be the same or less salary potentially uh you know it, it's individual it depends on the company but certainly if your goals you know the objective out here is that you're enjoying your job you're enjoying your life and and you're getting fairly compensated for it so there's a, we always say there's a bit of a triangle. If there's something that you're good at and you like doing and you get compensated for it, that's the perfect triangle of those things. So, you know, don't go into cybersecurity if you don't think that it's something that you're either going to be good at or you're going to enjoy. But certainly if you think you're good at it and enjoy, the, the third part of the triangle is you will be compensated and it may be a little bit down the road, but it's certainly, uh, it's the best place to be. Thank you. Janine, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I mean, again, pay, pay, I agree with Tracy because again, there are jobs. I, I was at a different position as well, you know, in finance, making more money, but I really love cybersecurity. And that was the reason I moved to cybersecurity. I, I believe I do okay. Like I, I'm not complaining about what I make, but the point is you make your choices. So uh, related to the job interviews, uh, I interviewed quite a bit of people uh, on and off interns, you know, regular people. What I look for is like, I don't negotiate money up until very, very late. And if I can, I don't at all. What we're looking for is, are you really interested? I mean, you don't have CISSP, you have absolutely no, you know, uh, you know, experience, you don't have any certifications, but if you can prove the hiring manager that you really are passionate, you really want to be in that business, you want to learn, you want to get certifications, that goes a long way. My frustrations usually are, I talk to people, they want to be cybersecurity people, but they don't have any clue about what actually it means to be a cybersecurity yes. person. So that takes back to my initial comment, please understand and learn what a cybersecurity person does. And if you really want to do that job, and then I think a lot of doors will open for you because uh, all hiring managers really, really understand that you're truly interested in that position. And then you will be fairly paid, in my opinion. Just because you're in cybersecurity doesn't mean you will not be paid, you know, fairly. Okay, Bill. Yeah, again, more of the same. I mean, if it's 
regardless of the security position, it's, it's kind of like joining any company. That's a, a risk benefit there. If you're excited about what you're doing, excited about the culture, we as the, the hiring company are excited, but having you there, we're going to do our best to, to keep you happy. So I don't, I don't think there's any sort of, um, Hey, we can get this person for a lot cheaper because they don't have a, a certain thing on their resume. It's, I think the company wants everyone to succeed. So we want people that want to be there. We don't want to penalize you for joining. Okay. I, I know now most people, I think, especially fresh graduates, they hear a lot about cybersecurity and it seems to be like it's a hot market for people to go and maybe, you know, some companies they are offering, you know, very good compensation packages. But the question is how people they can find out really if they, if they really have the passion to do this because as Jeanette said, you know, maybe you're not the right person, you know, to do this job. So in this case, you know, how people they gonna decide What's they really good at, or what's they they really passionate? If they have really passionate for cybersecurity, Tracy. I was gonna say maybe you should ask Bill first because you've asked him last every time, and he gets he gets. I get to parrot everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Oh, sorry, what, sorry, what Bill. Said? <laughs> no, no, I like that formula. Let's keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm preparing. <laughs> uh, well, I'll quickly say that. Uh, Every single skill set I can think of that a human being could have is needed in cybersecurity. So I'm really having a hard time imagining some skill that somebody has that would not be uh, applicable in some way, shape, and form. I have people who are have been in the healthcare sectors. Um, the you know there are so many jobs that are related to helping people through their cybersecurity issues like a service desk. There are roles, as you know, Junie said earlier, I spent a lot of time reading legal documentation and doing presentations and talking to clients about why we can't you know, leverage their existing network infrastructure. There are a lot of different roles out there. So I, I, you know what, if you think it's an interesting place to be, you do not necessarily have to be a network architect um, to to be a cybersecurity professional. I mean, it's only one facet. Again, software development. You don't have to be a developer to be a good cybersecurity right. professional. Having a little less fear about technology, and and one of the one of the things uh, you and I, Ferris, um, talked a lot about in our previous time together was uh, the ability to say no. Yeah. Because <laughs> you just have to say no to people <laughs> often. But your job, your job is to protect the company that you're working for and the people that work there. So that's probably the, the number one skill set is uh, interest in, and a little lack of fear and an ability to say no. Okay, thank you, Bill, because we have only two minutes. Bill, quickly, please. Sure. I mean, if someone's really worried about whether they may, may or not really enjoy it, it's, I mean, every company needs to be protected security-wise. But you can also pick what kind of company you want to protect, whether it's food, finance, you want to protect Netflix because you love movies, that kind of thing. So there's a there's a balance you can play to kind of mitigate your choice. Right, Jeanette. Uh, another thing is we mentioned uh, applying for jobs. If this is too scary, just read the job description. That's another advice I give to people that I mentor. Like, I mean, if you're going into going into a business, just go see what they're looking for, and very honestly, see if you have them. And if you don't, maybe look into opportunities to go you know, build up your experience or education on those skills. So that is another advice I can give to you. Just go see what kind of job descriptions are there that you'd like to do. Okay, thank you. So Tracy, a question because to you, because in IC Square, you know, we want to empower more women to be in cybersecurity. We want to see more ladies coming to cybersecurity. So what's your advice? What your message today? So we can, we can see more women in cybersecurity. I'm really sorry, guys, on this phone, but women are way better at this job than most. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Many other things. Uh, so. <laughs> no. um, well, me. and you have to have a little bit of a thick skin and realize that everyone sitting in the room with you will probably be a guy. Um, and uh, for some time, you know, but I have been in technology for over 30 years. I remember. I graduated from my program in school in 1987. And when I graduated, there was 55 guys and two women. And you just sort of have to say, you know what, we'll, 
just show that you're better than the rest of them and and you'll be good it's it's not a fair place out there like i'm not going to pretend that everybody's uh you know all all people are treated equally in the industry and it's sometimes tough when you're with a group of people who um uh, are all all focused on something a little bit different that is not your normal cultural experience but regardless the more of us there are out there the more that that will naturalize and normalize and it'll become the place that anyone can have a job and feel comfortable and not and and you know what i've never had a problem in my career to say just just go ahead and make it happen okay thank you so much we're on time so I see Square really appreciate, you know, you as the panelist for this is a great conversation and very insightful. I think a lot of people, they enjoyed, uh, we had uh, over 85, like 85 participants in this session. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and your contribution to this uh, session that's powered by IC Square and thank you uh, for CyberX. So thank you so much uh, for your time. Thanks for having us. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Stay healthy and stay safe.